So good morning. It is good to see you. I'm grateful to have each one of you here. And let's go ahead and open a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the day. Father, for the sun that is shining. And Father, at this time, we come before you. We thank you for the message. We just ask it to be your word spoken, that you uh, touch our hearts and help us to, uh, to listen to your word. And we just ask your blessings on this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, if you would, open up to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. And uh, starting with verse 59. Acts chapter... You guys can see me okay, can't you? Okay. Acts chapter 7 and verse 59. And it reads as follows. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now the story of Stephen... The story of Stephen is one which introduces the Apostle Paul before he met Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road. Uh, at that time, he was called Saul. And he was there at the stoning of Stephen, known as the one who held the clothes of the other. In fact, if you go back to uh, verse 55 of Acts chapter 7, that reads, But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, and this is Stephen, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the young man's feet whose name was Saul. And again, as we, excuse me, as we know, uh, he, his, this is the uh, Apostle Paul before his uh, experience with seeing Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road and then later named Paul. Uh, Stephen had a compassionate heart towards those who were, were killing him. Uh, he, he was basically saying, don't hold them guilty, forgive them. Uh, very similar words that Jesus spoke when he was on the cross in Luke chapter 23, verse 34. In fact, if you would, open your Bibles to Luke chapter 23. Luke 23 and verse 32. And it reads uh, as follows here. It says, And there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. This is uh, the time where Christ was going to be crucified. And the two other malefactors here, of course, is the two thieves hanging on either side of Jesus Christ. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and one on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. So here's two examples in scriptures here where someone's being killed, literally, where their life is on the line. And yet, while they're being attacked by their accusers, they ask the Heavenly Father to do something unimaginable. They are asking, forgive them. Forgive. Forgiveness. To not hold this account of hatred against them. Look at what the Lord went through leading up to the point of uh, up to the point where he gave up his spirit on the cross. Here are just a few things that he endured. Uh, he was he was lied about and falsely accused of crimes, both uh, godly and mankind uh, crimes. For example, they didn't like the fact that he professed to be the Son of God, so that was a godly crime. Although it was falsely accused, they still accused him of this. Uh, he was chastised and scourged. He was punished as if it was to teach him a lesson. Uh, he was chosen over a criminal to be punished. They let Barabbas go and chose Jesus Christ. 
He was stripped. He was given a crown of thorns, which was positioned on his head. And these things were big thorns that went deep into his, his skin. Uh, he was mocked multiple times and in multiple ways. They spit upon him. They smote him on the head. Uh, he was expected to carry his cross. Uh, he was hung and crucified with two thieves. He was forsaken by God, the, the Heavenly Father. And, and here we see where he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And of course, he had to do that because he had all the sins of the world, past, present, and future, on him, and God couldn't look at the sin. He had to turn his back on Christ. He was reviled. He was blasphemed spoke evil against, taunted, defamed, rebuked, and railed. And this is just a few things. There was more things that, that went on. But at one point, both thieves, not just one, but both of them, were speaking evil, speaking bad words against Christ. In fact, in Matthew 27, verse 44, it says, The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same teeth, or, or cast the same in his teeth. That is, they were both saying uh, bad things about him. Uh, the word thieves here is plural. Um, if you look up the scriptures and other translations and other versions of the Bible, you might find words like robbers, criminals, or something to that effect. And they all have the description in the plural form, more than one. So it was, it was both the thieves hanging on the cross that were, were saying wrong things about Christ. Originally, both criminals were talking hateful words to Jesus. But something happened while they were there, hanging on the cross. One con criminal continued showing that hatred towards Jesus in his speech, while the other realized that Christ was the Savior and asked the Lord to remember him in paradise. There was a repentance, a change of heart going on there, realizing that he as a criminal was worthy of his punishment and understood that the Lord as a son of God, did not deserve this in any fashion, form, or reason. There was compassion in the heart of Christ. He not only showed forgiveness towards this thief, but he showed it to the entire human race, past, present, and even the future. He revealed this by telling the criminal that he would be in paradise, and through his sacrifice to the, to the, and the words that he did for the world, Luke chapter 23, verses 34 and, and following. I'm just going to read portions of the, the passage where it says, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Again, he's showing that compassion. Verse 43, it says, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. There's Jesus Christ talking to that, uh, to that thief, showing compassion. Verse 46, And when Jesus has cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the Holy Ghost. Now with Christ, it's more understandable as to how he could be forgiving of those who are against him, since he is the perfect man, he's the Son of God. But what about Stephen? How could he be so forgiving? forgiving in this act of hatred and violence towards him. It all has to do with allowing the love of God to not only uh, being inside of him, but flowing through him towards those that have offended him. And we as children of God need to be able to show the same type of attitude to others who have in some way offended or hurt us. Um, in a book that I've read in the past called... Uh, the Pain and Pleasure of Forgiveness is by a gentleman named Dr. E.M. Johnson. Near the end of the book, he writes, The Bible commands us to forgive. Ephesians 4.32 says, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. We have the ability and provision to forgive in every situation. God has forgiven us through Christ's sake. We can never be deserving of such pleasure and profit as to be forgiven. We have all sinned, and one who sins deserves hell. Because of Calvary, we can enjoy forgiveness. Jesus Christ is the re reason that we forgive others. He died for the sins as well as our sins. And he goes on to state that there's 
an importance to understanding the definition to the word forgiveness. So the question that we have here is, what does it mean to forgive? Let's look at it from mankind's point of view, how it's described in the uh, dictionary. The Oxford language notes that the word forgive is a verb. It's an action word. It's something that actually has to be done. Uh, it's not something that just happens on its own. And it means it's uh, in the third person, it's present. Um, third person present, the word is forgives. Past tense is the word forgave. And here's a word that I just found out, gerund, which is a form that is derived from a verb but functions as a noun, and in the English it has the ending ing. Uh, for example, asking in, do you mind my asking you? And in, and in the present participle, it's the word, word forgiving, in the past participle, it's forgiven. And it means to uh, stop feeling angry or resentful towards someone for an offense, flaw, or mistake. An example they give is, I don't think I'll ever forgive David for what, the way he treated me. Similar words that are used are pardon, excuse, exonerate, absolve, acquit. It also means to cancel a debt, uh, to stop blaming or being angry with someone for something that the person has done or not to punish them for something. This came from the Cambridge Advanced Learners Dictionary and Thesaurus. It also means to stop being angry with someone who has done something wrong. Example, she apologized and he forgave her. Now the word forgiveness letting go of grudges and bitterness. When someone you care about hurts you, you can hold on to anger, resentment, and thoughts of revenge or embrace forgiveness and move forward. And that's the hard part. Um, it took me probably 35, 40 years to figure out how to truly let go of things. And even now, I still have struggles with it. That's where i got to let the Lord control that. What is forgiveness? Forgiveness means different things to different people. Generally, however, it involves the decisions to, to let go of resentment and thoughts of revenge. The act that hurt or offended you might always be with you, but forgiveness can lessen its grip on you and help free you from the control of the person who harmed you. Forgiveness can even lead to feelings of understanding, empathy, and compassion. Forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting or excusing the harm that's been done to you. It doesn't nullify that. It doesn't... Um, make what they've said or done okay. But what that forg forgiving does is it brings peace. It helps you to go on with life. And what are the benefits of forgiving someone? Uh, letting go of the grudge and bitterness can actually make a way to improve your health. Uh, peace of mind, forgiveness can lead to a healthier, healthier relationship. And this is coming from the Mayo Clinic. Uh, it can improve mental health, uh, lessen anxiety, lower blood pressure, um, have fewer symptoms of depression, uh, your immune system can be stronger, a healthier heart, improved self-esteem. And what are the effects of holding on to a, a grudge? If you're unforgiving, you might bring anger and bitterness into every relationship and new experience in your life. Um, might become so wrapped up in the wrong that you can't even enjoy the present become even more depressed or anxious. Feel that your life lacks meaning or purpose, uh, loss of valuable and enriching connections with others. Dr. E.M. Johnson went on to write in his book, he said that according to the Noah Webster's Dictionary uh, from 1928, to forgive is to pardon, to treat the offender as not guilty. Forgiveness is to pardon the offender, to stop coming, stop the coming blow as we forgive a person that requires action on, on our part. Many times we will never experience true forgiveness until we have first thanked God for the difficulties caused by others. And that's a hard thing to do is, is to thank God for the, um, 
the hardships that we face. But God knew before time what would happen, and he allows us to go through certain things to draw us closer to him, to, uh, to help us to understand things better, to uh, allow his glory to be evident through the whole process. You know, not too long ago, I was driving in the car, I was driving in a car not too long ago, and I was dwelling on a recent incident uh, where somebody had promised me something. Uh, they would do something, but they fell through with this promise. They did not keep their words. And due to the importance of the nature of this event, it actually really hurt me deeply. Uh, that was the most that I had, had actually struggled with um, forgiveness in a long, long time. And although I knew I needed to forgive the person that struggled with the emotions of letting it go and allowing the Lord to do what he sees best in this, it was very difficult for me. And as this was roaming through my mind, through my thoughts, I began to pray to the Father, telling him, I know I need to forgive. I know it's important, but it's really hard. I've been hurt. The pain has made it difficult for me to let go and to forgive. And it that exact moment, it was as if the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart, shared with my thoughts, as if Christ was speaking to me personally. And the thought that came to my mind was as if Christ was asking me, what about me when I hung on the cross? What about the sins that you and the rest of the world have committed against me? And yet I still forgave you. I forgave the whole world. Can't you even forgive for just this one little thing? And in the eyes of Christ, it is a little thing. In my mind, it was a huge thing. But looking at it perspectively, it really wasn't that huge. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. Wow, God forgave me for so much more than this one little thing. And with that, I was able to, to settle my thoughts and my emotions and allow the forgiveness of God to work in me. Uh, seeking forgiveness for not being able to forgive, as well as allowing his forgiveness to uh, uh, flow through me towards this other person. And this reminds me of Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, verses 21 through 35, where Peter comes to the Lord and he asks, How often should I pray? There we go. He says, how often should I pray? Uh, is seven times enough? Matthew chapter 8, verses 21 and 22 says, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times 7. We'll talk a little bit more about this next week. But yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about this next week. But Jesus responded not 7 times, but 70 times. And Christ was not limiting the length of forgive, the forgiving process, but base, excuse me, basically stating that there is no ending in the process of forgiveness. It's a continual and eternal thing. Peter thought it was being magnanimous. The rabbis citing several verses from Amos were taught that since God forgave Israel's enemies only three times, it was presumptuous and unnecessary to forgive anyone more than three times. So here, they're saying seven times. Well, this is even more than the three. But no matter how many times that someone sins and, and repents, the number seven was not to, to set a limit on a number of things of forgiveness, seven times 70, but precisely the opposite. Christ meant that forgiveness should be granted unendingly, without end. It should be a continual thing. Um, 
we'll continue here a little bit more next week and we'll continue a little bit further on forgiveness and how we should forgive if we expect God to forgive us. But I'd like to share a, a short video with you real quick before closing. Anyone familiar with Italian opera or the plays of Shakespeare knows the terrible price paid for grudges, vendetta, and revenge. Under the sway of these emotions, painful incidents linger in the mind, sapping our ability to find peace and happiness. The 18th century English poet Alexander Pope gave us the antidote, to err is human, to forgive divine. But finding a way to forgive without giving up our principles is often no easy task. In this course, I'm going to address what forgiveness is and how to implement it. I'll be speaking here about forgiveness where it is most often needed, in the context of your everyday personal life with family members, friends, coworkers, and business associates. One of our challenges in understanding this process is that the word forgiveness is inadequate to explain a very complex concept. Forgiveness actually embodies three different things, each of which applies to different situations and provides different results. The three types of forgiveness are exoneration, forbearance, and release. Let's take each in turn. Exoneration is the closest to what we usually think of when we say forgiveness. Exoneration is wiping the slate entirely clean and restoring a relationship to the full state of innocence it had before the harmful actions took place. There are three common situations in which exoneration applies. The first takes place when you realize that the harmful action was a genuine accident for which no fault can be assigned. The second is when the offender is a child or someone else who, for whatever reason, simply didn't understand the hurt they were inflicting and toward whom you have loving feelings. The third situation occurs when the person who hurt you is truly sorry, takes full responsibility without excuses for what they did, asks forgiveness, and gives you confidence that they will not knowingly repeat their bad action in the future. In all such situations, it is essential to accept their apology and offer them the complete forgiveness of exoneration. You'll feel better and so will the person who hurt you. In fact, not to offer forgiveness in these circumstances would be harmful to your own well-being. It might even suggest that there is something more wrong with you than with the person who caused you pain. The second type of forgiveness I call forbearance, and here things get a little more complicated. Forbearance applies when the offender makes a partial apology or mingles their expression of sorrow with blame that you somehow caused them to behave badly. An apology is offered, but it is not what you had hoped for and may not even be fully authentic. While you should always reflect on whether there was a provocation on your part, even when you bear no responsibility, you should exercise forbearance if the relationship matters to you. Cease dwelling on the particular offense, do away with grudges and fantasies of revenge, but retain a degree of watchfulness. This is similar to forgive but not forget, or trust but verify. By using forbearance, you are able to maintain ties to people who, while far from perfect, are still important to you. Furthermore, in some cases, after a sufficient period of good behavior, forbearance can rise to exoneration and full forgiveness. But what do you do when the person who hurt you doesn't even acknowledge that they've done anything wrong or gives an obviously insincere apology making no reparations whatsoever? These are the cases of forgiveness that are the most challenging. In my practice, I find this in such examples as adult survivors of child abuse, business people who've been cheated by their partners, or friends or relatives who've betrayed one another. Still, even here there is a solution. I call it release, the third type of forgiveness. Release does not exonerate the offender, nor does it require forbearance. It doesn't even demand that you continue the relationship. But it does ask that instead of continuing to define your life in terms of the hurt done, you release your bad feelings and your preoccupation with the negative things that happen to you. Release does something that is critically important. It allows you to let go of the burden, the silent tax that is weighing you down and eating away at your chance for happiness. 
If you do not release the pain and anger and move past dwelling on old hurts and betrayals, you will be allowing the ones who hurt you to live rent-free in your mind, reliving forever the persecution that the original incident started. Whether you get there through your own efforts, through psychotherapy, through religion, or some other method, release liberates you from the tyranny of living in the traumatic past, even when the other forms of forgiveness, exoneration and forbearance, are not possible. Exoneration, forbearance, release. To forgive may be divine, but when we understand its dimensions, we find that it is within our ability to do it. I'm Dr. Stephen Marmer of UCLA Medical School for Prager University. Those last two seems like the ones that are probably the more easiest ones. In fact, that's the ones that I typically do myself. Some, like that situation in the car, basically I just released it. I, I let it go and let the Lord deal with it. Um, I didn't require somebody to apologize. I didn't require some other action of, you know, showing remorse or anything. I let go, I released it, I gave it to the Lord, and it actually became a little bit of a forbearance. And, uh, you know, sometimes that's all you can do. But I find that if you can even release it, um, you, you don't have all that stress in you, you don't have that anxiety, you don't have that depression, you don't have all those negative things going on, and you can move on in life, you can start singing the very next second praises to God and, and actually mean it. So um, it's been a long journey for me to, to, to learn things about forgiveness, and I haven't learned it all. But, uh, you know, Christ said on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And if Christ can forgive literally all the sins of the world, who are we to withhold one or two things? So let's go ahead and close up in a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the forgiveness that you have given us. If it wasn't through that, through the work of Jesus Christ, through his life, his sacrifice, his, his blood, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, Father, if it wasn't for all for that, we could not have everlasting life. We could not have a relationship with you. We would eternally be separated from you. And Father, you want us to draw closer to you. You, you want to have a relationship. You want to have fellowship. And Father, we seek the same thing here at church. Help us to draw closer to you. And through whatever process it may be that we may need to do, uh, seeking to be forgiven from someone else or even needing to forgive uh, someone else. Father, we just pray throughout the whole process that you help us to take the right steps and to move closer to you. Father, I lift our, our family here, our heavenly family, Father, that may not even be here. Father, we just lift them before you. We do ask your blessings on them this week, throughout the journeys of today and throughout each day of this week. We ask that your will be done. We do ask for protection. Continue to keep us safe from COVID and other incidents. Pray for those families and friends and, and acquaintances that we know of that have been affected by this flood. And I pray that you just work through this whole process as well. Father, we lift this rest of this day before you and we ask your blessings on it. In Jesus' name, amen. Continue staying safe. Um, I know that they're starting to release some of the mask mandates, um, but you know if you feel more comfortable with it, I urge you to, to do what you feel is, is safe for you and your family. Um, pray that nobody gets it. Um, I was fortunate to have a, a minor case of it, and I and that wasn't fun. So I don't, and I know some of you are taking care of, of uh, others, you know, the elderly and whatnot. So you know, keeping safe is very important. So I. Appreciate that, and just pray that you all have a good, safe week. Remember that uh, God does love you. Julie and I love you, and, and your church family loves you. And Lord, Ron, we'll see you next week.